book of second timothy chapter 3 verse number 15 second timothy chapter 3 verse number 15 brother paul writes a letter to timothy and he says to timothy and that from a child thou was known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in christ jesus so now brother paul began to deal with the study of the scripture itself the study of the scriptures itself brother paul's hermeneutics or brother paul's interpretation of the old testament there is focused on salvation through faith in christ and that is what he discusses in this text of scripture he obviously wasn't saying that the old testament is salvation through faith only he must have selected what he taught from there as salvation through faith which is in christ jesus in verse 16 he now says all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness did you observe given by inspiration meaning that the scriptures came out of the breath of god god breathed on certain individuals so all scriptures are given by inspiration of god and they are profitable the word of philemos means advantageous or profitable for doctrine which is teaching or explanation that the scriptures will only benefit you and profit you when they are taught and explained in the light of christ because first john chapter 5 verse 20 tells us first john chapter 5 verse 20 tells us and we know that the son of god is come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son jesus christ this is the true god jesus is the true god and eternal life jesus is the true god and eternal life so the scriptures are taught and explained in the light of christ for the profitability of the saints and when they are taught and explained they will bring you to a place of reproof that's the second prophet of scripture the word reproof there is not the english reproof is the bible reproof it means it's a, a, a you know a greek word reproof it means evidence same word in hebrews 11 1. now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence the reproof of things not seen the evidence which means the gospel is a message of faith or the gospel is a message of conviction or the gospel is a message of persuasion now when you are persuaded about the gospel it produces correction correction epanotesis correction the word reproof is the word electros. Ephanatosis means correction, a resetting of the mind, an unlearning to relearn, to reset something the way it is supposed to be. And now when there is an unlearning to relearn, when there is a resetting of your mind, it will now produce the fourth benefit of scripture, which is instruction in righteousness which is the word pedia in the greek which means raising up a child by the way of the mouth actually it means spiritual growth that means there can be no genuine spiritual growth in the life of a believer until that believer is exposed to doctrine which will produce reproof which will produce correction which will arrive at instruction in righteousness that the man of god may be perfect truly furnished unto every good work now this is so important that you remember that brother paul is simply saying that the doctrine of salvation is the core of christian doctrine within the old testament it is also for the persuasion meaning a message of faith that brings correction and that ultimately produces spiritual growth so the gospel produces faith in the hearer and when that faith comes alive that faith results in salvation 
the book of John chapter 3 verse 36 John chapter 3 verse number 36 whoever is on the computer you need to walk with me he that believeth on the son hath everlasting life did you observe the tenses hath everlasting life and he that believeth not the son shall not see life a man that does not believe in Jesus shall not see life but the wrath of God abideth on him a man that does not believe in the resurrection of Jesus shall not see life has only the wrath of God the Bible says a man that is not born of God is a child of wrath he is under the control of the prince of the power of the air he is a child of wrath the wrath of God abideth on the man that does not believe the gospel. Now that's very bold a claim. Look at John chapter 5 verse 24. John chapter 5 verse number 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. Did you see the emphasis? Believeth, believeth, believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He shall never come unto condemnation. He has already passed from death to life. That's what Brother Paul was telling the church in, in Rome. That the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free or made me free from the law of sin and death. The believer in Jesus shall never come to condemnation. He shall never come to wrath. He has passed from death to life. Can I have a powerful amen? Look at the book of John chapter 6 verse 47. John chapter 6 verse 47 verily verily i say unto you he that believeth on me hath everlasting life he that believeth on me hath everlasting life look at john chapter 11 verse 25 john chapter 11 verse 25 <clears throat> jesus said unto her I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He that believeth in me will be raised from the dead, spiritual death. That's why the Bible tells us in Ephesians, he has quickened us together raised us up together made us sit together in the heavenlies in christ jesus are you still here so first john chapter 5 verse 1 first john chapter 5 verse 1 whosoever believeth did you see the emphasis is on belief believeth that jesus is the christ is born of god he that believeth that jesus is a man he is the Christ. The Christ means a man. He is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 of that's first John, chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God, he that believeth is born of God. For who, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith in Christ. We are world overcomers. We will not overcome the world. We have overcome the world. We have overcome the world. Can somebody say that very loud? No, don't say we have. Say I have. Can I hear you one more time? I want to hear it louder and louder. The radio audience wants to hear you clearly. It will not be a bad thing to repeat it one more time. 
All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. I have overcome the world. The prince of this world and the world system is under the believer. The believer is in absolute, total, continual victory. I didn't have a good amen. Now, this morning, I want to get us into some apologia from scripture. And I want you to pay attention. I want to deal with something that is very critical to the Christian faith. I want to answer the most important question that a Christian can ever answer in all of his life. The most important question that a believer can ever answer in all of his lifetime. Well, some believers will say, well, the most important question will be, what must I do to be saved? Well, the guy who asked that question was told, believe. And we saw from scriptures that the guarantee for salvation is faith which is in Christ Jesus. Believe in Christ Jesus. Now, but once you answer the question of salvation, there is another important fundamental question that will be asked. That question will have to do with the authority on which you base your answer on salvation. The authority on which you base your answer on salvation. So ultimately, you're going to answer the question why do you believe the bible why do you believe the bible why not the quran why not some occultic books why the bible that is one question every believer will have to answer why have you decided that the, the Bible is final authority in your life? Why? <laughs> Why? Why not some other book? Why not biology? Why not psychology? Why the Bible? You know, some of you have never thought of that before. Why the Bible? You go for evangelism and somebody say, why should I even believe anything in this book? What will you tell them? What will you tell them? Why the Bible? That's one question every child of God must answer. And that's one question every sinner should ask Christians. Why the Bible? Why not the book of Mormon? Why not the book of Mormon? Why the Bible? There are other ancient books. There are other religious documents. Why not those? Why the Bible? Think about it for a second. I chose to deal with this on Christmas Day so you never forget it all your life. Why the Bible? Why do you choose to believe the Bible? Why the Bible above other books? Why the Bible instead of other books? Because ultimately, everybody have their own set of beliefs. Why do you want me to abandon my traditional worship and believe a Bible that I don't know where it was written from? At least my idol worship, my traditional religion, I know it originated from my ancestors. Why the Bible? Why not Ebo Masquerade? Then I know where it came from. Why do you want me to believe the Bible? Everybody have had their own set of books. And everybody ascribes authority to their books. This is a question we have to answer. And it's a question people have a right to ask. If you are not a believer, you have a right to ask this question and get it answered beyond every shadow of doubt. And this is the critical point or this is the crux of the matter. And until this question is answered in a man's life, he will never have absolute confidence in the authority of scripture. That's why some people are in church, but they still have some native doctors somewhere that they consult. Because they have not 
being confronted with the truth of why must I even rely on the Bible? That's why you have some preachers who say, even if after death we discover that heaven does not exist, I have no regrets. Why will you talk like that? Why will a pastor say such a thing? Why will a preacher of the gospel be saying, even after this life, if I discover that there is no heaven, I have no... Why will he talk like that? Why will he say, well, after I die, if I discover that there's no eternity with God, I have no regrets. Why will a preacher be talking like that? It's the fact that he himself has not come to a place of persuasion and conviction on the infallibility and authority of the Bible. So why the Bible? Are you ready? If you are sleeping by now, I'm sure you're awake. Why the Bible? Because everything you discuss as a Christian concerning your faith and eternity is going to hinge on that question, why the Bible? So, let's start today's teaching by answering that question. If someone asks you, where will you be after death? Is there even a life after death? You say, yes, I will be with Jesus. And he will ask you, why do you think or why do you know you will be with Jesus? You will say, because 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 says so. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 6. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Next verse. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Next verse. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So, Brother Paul submits that the moment you die and drop this body, you are present with the Lord. Okay? While in this body, you are absent from the Lord, meaning physically. But the moment this body drops, you are present with the Lord. So absence from the body is present with the Lord. So when I drop this body, or when this body expires, mortality gives way, automatically I will be with Jesus. Now, <clears throat> if you are a student here and your professor in the university says to you, Using the theory of evolution that man came from apes. Man evoluted or man came out of apes or monkeys. And you stand up and say to your professor, that is not true. He says, why do you say so? He said, because the Bible teaches that God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And he says, can you prove it? You see, Genesis chapter 2, look at it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Then he now asks you, so if you say man didn't come from monkeys, man was created by God and man came from the dust of the ground. Why do you believe the Bible? And why not science? Science has scientific facts. Why the Bible? Well, <laughs> The weakest answer many Christians will give is because I was raised to believe the Bible. I was raised to believe the Bible. Just like others were raised to believe in idol worship. Just like others were raised to believe in the Holy Quran. Then you and the Muslim and the Buddhists are just engaged in a contest. My own is better than your own. My own is better than your own. It's just a contest. Because all of you were raised to believe it. 
That's not an answer at all. You are in a contest of whose God is bigger. Another response people will give is because you can't argue with a personal experience. The things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I tried it and it changed my life. Come and try it. That is because you are the only person that have tried something that changed your life before. <laughs> so because you tried it, it changed your life. You also want me to try to change my life. You don't know that there are people that have done some discipline that have changed their life experiences that is not Bible. If you answer a professor like that, he will make rubbish of you in that class. He will make you doubt why you even carry a Bible. Because I tried it. And it worked. So anybody trying anything that works means that thing has become a God to the person. So how do you deal with such a situation that challenges the inerrancy, the errorlessness and the authority of the Bible. Well, let me give you an answer, then I'll explain. Are you ready? Somebody said to me very loud, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents. Because it is a reliable collection of historical documents. I want to hear your voices written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses they report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and their writings are divine rather than human in origin did you get that are you writing? Now write. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection. A reliable collection of historical documents. Written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. Written by eyewitnesses. During the lifetime of other eyewitnesses, they report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and their writings are divine rather than human in origin. Their writings are divine rather than human in origin. I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses they report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and their writings are divine rather than human in origin now let's explain this with scriptural evidence do you have it written are you with me Okay. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16 For we have not followed cunningly devised fables Cunningly devised fables When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
And somebody says, but you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible. That is secular reasoning. The goal here is not to prove the Bible. The goal here is to answer the question, why the Bible? I'm not here to prove the Bible or to defend the Bible. Jesus, the message of the Bible is alive and is able to defend himself. I don't need to defend Jesus. He is able to defend himself. The question here is why do I choose to believe the Bible and not any other book as my final authority? Well, the answer is in the same Bible. I choose to believe the Bible because there is no higher authority than the Bible. So I'm going to answer the question from the same Bible. There's no higher authority. If, if I were to make reference to another authority to defend the Bible, I will be conceding the fact that there is a higher authority than the Bible. Since there's none, it is still the same Bible that will defend itself. I'm establishing to you this morning that this is the highest authority, the Bible. Therefore, by definition, I cannot appeal to another authority. 2 Peter 1.16 again. Teaching good? For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were eyewitnesses. Now Peter in this text of scripture is responding to questions and queries about the authority of the scriptures. So let's read it through. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 16 to 21. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. Next verse. For he received from the Father, I mean from God the Father, honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost as they were moved by the Holy Ghost so this is Peter's response and it is from this response we got the answer that I gave to you so let's deal with it step by step. First, it's a reliable collection of historical documents. Can I hear you say it twice? One to go. Let me hear you say it again. It's important that it's reliable. And it's important that it's a collection. It's important that it's reliable and it's important that it's a collection. And it is important that it is historical. All that is important. It is reliable, it is a collection, and it is historical. Three words. Reliable, collection, historical. Okay, are you still here? Can we all say it together? Everybody want to go three words? Let me hear you louder. Don't speak like you're apologizing. Want to go? All this is important. 
Now the Bible is unlike many holy books all over the world. In that the Bible is a collection. You don't have just one individual who says he heard from God or one individual who says an angel visited him or one individual who said he saw a vision or one individual who said he met with God. It's a collection. Not just one individual who narrates his experience. Therefore, everybody has to listen to him. No, it's a collection. The Bible is a collection. The Bible was written on three different continents. Asia, Africa, and Europe. Three different continents. The Bible was written in three different languages. Mainly Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. Three continents. Three languages. The Bible was written by over 40 authors. 40 authors. Over 40 authors. Some of them were kings. Some of them were generals. Some of them were fishermen. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them were doctors. Some of them were historians. Some of them were journalists. We have people from all walks of life. Over 40 different authors from all walks of life who gave us the 66 volumes. 66 volumes. Over 40 authors. And these 66 volumes covers hundreds of subjects. Various subjects. They were written over a period of more than 1500 years. Over a period of 1500 years. So let me recap. Three continents. Three languages. More than 40 authors. Hundreds of subjects and topics. Written over a period of 1500 years. This is a reliable collection of historical documents. It's not just one individual making a claim. This is very key. This is very key. Oftentimes we don't comprehend that all those came together to give us the Bible. It actually adds to the credibility of the Bible. The fact that it is a reliable collection of historical documents. Now look was a physician and a historian so dr luke now will give us his own account luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us next verse even as they delivered them unto us which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the world. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things, from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, verse 4, that thou mayest know the certainty of those things, wherein thou hast been instructed that thou mayest know the certainty we are not doing kalo kalo the certainty the surety of those things so Luke was not an eyewitness Dr. Luke was not an eyewitness and he doesn't claim to be one he's a historian who claimed to have traced the information from the eyewitnesses of the incarnation into the resurrection a lot of people say why do we have four gospels then in the bible well because all those four gospels are telling the same story from different perspectives and the fact that this man was not an eyewitness but collected facts 
from those who were eyewitnesses. Some of Brother Luke's chief eyewitnesses was a female, Mary and Peter. Chiefly, they were the eyewitnesses he relied upon. So, he gets information from eyewitnesses and he openly says he is not an eyewitness but that he collected the information from the eyewitnesses and that he has followed everything closely from the first until now and he wanted to write an orderly account here is another reason why we have four gospels Luke's goal in writing is history and chronology. That's the goal of Luke. In his writings, all he is interested in is to preserve the history and chronology. Luke's goal is, I want to give you the events as they happened in order. John's goal is evangelism. That's why John said in John 20, 31. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. That is why John wrote. He wrote to convince you to believe so that in believing you might have life how many of you remember when i started the teaching all the scriptures i read on believe believe at the last in life were from john because john's focus was evangelism to get people to believe so his goal is evangelism so john orders his gospel around seven major signs in the book of john there were only seven miracles and those seven miracles are pointers to the fact that Jesus is the Christ. I've taught you on the seven miracles. And that they were signs. So that way he organizes his gospel. Beginning from turning water to wine. This beginning of miracles did Jesus and showed forth his glory. That's how he began his gospel. With the miracle of turning water to wine. Now, Mark's gospel is the shortest of the gospels. Mark is very, very, very brief. And his writings is about brevity. One of his favorite words is straightway. Immediately. <laughs> you know the book of Mark. Straightway. Immediately. Immediately she was healed. Straightway he went. Straight away he stood up. Immediately her eyes were open. Alright, so he is straight to facts. He didn't go around in, in you know in all the story. He was just straight. Matthew's writing is to a Jewish audience. He wants to demonstrate that Jesus is the promised Messiah. So that is why Matthew begins with genealogy. Genealogy. Tracing how that all this genealogy led to the birth of Christ. And the moment Matthew announced the birth, genealogy ended. Because the intent of the genealogy was to show that Jesus was not a bastard. Was to show that Jesus was not a muthos. It wasn't a myth was to show that Jesus was not a fairy tale. Was to show that Jesus was not a fantasized story. So he traced the genealogy. So that anybody in Israel can go to Israel right now and trace where Jesus came from. So it's not like one guy who fell from the sky and said, I am Jesus. No. The, you know, you know the, the incarnation, which is what we are celebrating today, the incarnation is critical in the defense of the gospel. That Jesus didn't just fall from the sky. Come unto me, all in that labor and a heavy letter. No, 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 no. They say genealogy. We can trace his father. We can trace his ancestors. We can trace his great great grandfather. There is proof. We 
can trace where he came from. So there's genealogy. Why? Because Matthew was establishing among the Jews that Jesus is the very Christ. So Matthew is pointing backwards. The idea here is we have a reliable collection of historical documents. We have a reliable collection of historical documents. Luke is saying here in Luke chapter 1 verse 1 to 4 that this is a historical document. Peter says in 2 Peter 1 16 in other words they were not myths. We have not followed cunningly devised fables. It's not a fantasized story. This is not the figment of a man's imagination. Like Jesse Mel Jael and Jemima who sits down to fantasize. They write their stories. They just sit down in my room and create their stories. After creating it, they script it and put parts and create characters and then act it and make it real. When they cry, tears are coming out. They are not, they are not being funny. When you watch it, your emotions get affected because they craftily and skillfully created the stories to be as real as reality can be. And then they now interpret it in motion pictures. No. The scriptures were not some people who sat down in a corner to script a fantasy. That's what Peter is saying. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus. But we were I, we saw it. We saw it. I'm teaching good. See, if you miss this one, you have no basis for your Christianity. I'm, I'm not joking. I'm very serious. We didn't hear some fantasy somewhere. We were eyewitnesses of his excellent majesty. We were even there. When a voice came out of heaven, we saw Elijah and Moses. We saw them disappear. We heard the voice say, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. We were there. They didn't tell us. It can be proven in the annals of history with evidence. Shakobala. So it's not a collection of mythos. These were facts. Notice the first next phrase. But we are eyewitnesses of his excellent majesty. So notice the second part of our definition for defense. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. Written by I witnesses. Somebody, can we all say it together? Say it after me. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. Now say it, let me hear you. Want to go? He says we were eyewitnesses. Look at John, first John chapter 1, verse 1. First John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Did you take note of that? <laughs> Did you take note of that? Had seen, looked upon, touched. That's key. That's key. We have seen it. We have heard it. A historical collection of reliable documents written by eyewitnesses. These were not people who had a vision. 
They didn't die. It was not a subconscious experience. It was not an out of body experience. They were not suspended in an open vision. They say we touched it. We touched him. We saw him. We heard him. We know what we are talking about. Zekodagaba. Teaching good? Eyewitnesses to these events wrote about the events that they saw themselves. So we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses. But they were written during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. So it's not just that witnesses wrote the document. When they wrote the documents, other eyewitnesses of the same events were alive. Are we teaching here? Other eyewitnesses of the same events were alive. Kabadaba. So let's say it again. Say with me, we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses that is fundamental written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses a lot of people who argue with that you know let's take care of those argumentators first corinthians 15 verse 1 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 1 Moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel Which I preach unto you Which also you have received And wherein you stand Next verse By which also you are saved If you keep in memory what I preach unto you Unless you have believed in vain Next verse For I delivered unto you first of all That which I also received How that Christ died For our sins According to the scriptures And that he was buried And that he rose again The third day according to the scriptures And that he was seen of Cephas Peter Then of the twelve Next verse After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once of which of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are falling asleep next verse after that he was seen of james then of all the apostles at and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time do the mathematics if you do the math there is at least 301 witness to the resurrection who were alive when first corinthians was written 301 witnesses who were still alive who saw the resurrection when first corinthians was written teaching good A smart group of critics will say he said 12 12 saw him alive then they say but there's a contradiction that's what some smart critics will say he said because Judas hung himself before Jesus rose so how could the writer of Corinthians say 12 saw him Judas died before Jesus rose. So they couldn't have been 12. If it was a correct documentation, it should have been 12. That's what some critics who think they are smart will say to you. Unless you are studious with the rest of the Bible, then you will discover that there's Acts chapter 1 verse 20. Acts chapter 1 verse 20. Let's take care of those guys. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. Next verse. 
Wherefore, of these men, which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Next verse. Beginning from the baptism of John, unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Next verse. And they appointed two, Joseph called Basabas, who was so named Justus and Matthias. Next verse. Next verse. And they prayed and said, Thou Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen. Next verse. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Next verse. And they gave forth their lords, and the Lord fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So Matthias was the twelve who saw the resurrection. So there couldn't have been a contradiction. So 12 apostles. So that scripture is accurate. Are we together here? Now, the requirement was that for you to be an apostle of the Lamb. There are two classes of apostles. There are apostles of the Lamb. Only 12. And when they died, that was the end. Then the second class of apostles are the apostles of his resurrection. Which Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says He gave some upon his resurrection Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers So today we don't have the apostles of the Lamb Because 12 of them are dead What we have today is the apostles of his resurrection The gift to the church For the equipping of the saints To do the work of ministry So the apostles of the Lamb Which were eyewitnesses of the resurrection Were 12 and that 12 was very important. Important number. That's why they replaced the number 12. When he hung himself. So there would still be 12. And by definition, being in the 12 was that you have to be an eyewitness of the resurrection. No contradiction. But that just goes to the heart of our presuppositions when you read the Bible. You know, some people just read the Bible to find fault. Not to be built up. When you give them all of them, say, but what about, what about, those are illiterates. Illiterates are always about what about, because they're always about. Give a dummy 40 evidences, he will still argue. Give a fool one evidence, I mean, give a wise man one evidence, he will calm down. Now, there are more than 25,000 archaeological digs direct directed directly to the subject matter of the bible over 25000 archaeological digs not one of them have contradicted anything we have in the bible over 25000 archaeological digs none has contradicted the bible and the overwhelming majority of of them have confirmed and affirmed what we have in the bible but here's what is interesting when you find something in the Bible a thousand times over, they still try to argue. Then they find evidence in archaeological digs, and then when they discover it is, it is not a contradiction, they apologize. Then they look for another one. When they discover it is not, they apologize. Over 25,000 archaeological digs. What we find here on this text, about 301 eyewitnesses of his resurrection, who were still alive when 1 Corinthians was written. This is important because that means the message of the Bible is falsifiable. The message of the Bible is falsifiable. Did you hear that English? It's falsifiable. This is important when you are testing the veracity of the claim. When somebody is making a claim, that claim can't be falsified that means you can't test the claim it's not a very strong claim any claim that you cannot falsify it's not a strong claim if you can't test it it means i just have to trust what you say you know it's like a vision you know i'm saying i saw a vision i saw the clouds you see clouds from where i saw just believe me. You can prove it. You can check it. But the Bible is not like that. 
But those claims were falsifiable when Paul wrote it. Because the witnesses who saw the resurrection were there. See, they could have said, uh, that's not correct. They could have said, oh, oh, it didn't happen like that. It was a falsifiable claim. Yet, it was never falsified. It was never. Nobody falsified it. So, the Bible is a reliable collection of historical documents by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. But observe a problem. Some people are overeducated. We have truth and lies. <laughs> Some people propounded a theory that these things were written later. And that there was this Constantine guy. I don't know if you have heard that theory. There was this Constantine guy and he put stuff together and he said, get rid of other stuff. Okay? So let's deal with a few things. Again, a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. I am claiming that the Bible was written early. I am claiming and establishing to you that the Bible, the New Testament, was written early. The New Testament was finished in the first century. A little early into the second century depending on how you date it but it's very early and there are people that will argue with these on a couple of different fronts so let's engage them let's deal with the easier one they said that the bible is not reliable because it has been translated so many times have you heard that it has been translated so many times. There are thousands of translations. How can there be many translations of the same book? That you can't trust what we have because it has been translated so many times. And the people who make this claim are either ignorant or evil or both. They are either ignorant or evil or ignorant and evil. I'm not being funny. It is funny that there are people who claim to be intelligent who continue to make this argument. And you know what is annoying me? That people are not laughing at them. Because when they make the argument, you just break forth into laughter. Because here is the issue. If I am the Hebrew and Greek manuscript, the original, and I'm here, Hebrew and Greek, Pastor Eshet translates from me. Dr. Gabriel translates from me. Pastor Jerome transmits from me, translates from me. Pastor Prince translates from me. Elder Ephiok translates from me. Okay? You following? Now, all of them translated from me. If you have a problem with their translation, come to me. I'm still here. I don't know if you understand. It's not like Pastor Gabriel translated from Pastor Eshet. Then Pastor Jerome translated from... No. All of them brought their translation from me using the English that was available as at the time they were translating. And since English is progressive, that's why some translations are expressed different from others. But you can still trace all the translations to the original. So that's why people have that argument ought to be laughed at. But they are dummies. To say the least. Teaching God. <laughs> Which means each translation came from the Greek and the Hebrew. They all came from one source. That's why I say people argue like that. Either ignorant or evil. How can any intelligent human being argue against the validity of the Bible because of the number of times it has been translated? 
If you bother go and read Hebrew and Greek, you will find out that there's no problem with the translation. And today we can even test it better because we are, we are better armed with tools. There's no secrecy here. In fact, we are more capable today. Some say, well, the documents we have are late documents. And we don't know what it is in those earlier documents. Let's look at that. In dealing with the manuscripts themselves, when it comes to the Bible, it's true that we don't have originals because of the materials on which the originals were written on. You didn't hear that? Because of the materials on which the originals were written on. So we don't have the originals. Now let's restrict ourselves because of time to the New Testament. When we talk about the New Testament, we don't have any originals. But we have documents that date back as early as AD 100 to AD 120. We have documents that date back to as early as AD 100 to AD 120. That's within a couple of decades of the completion of the New Testament. We have over 6,000 manuscripts or portions of manuscripts of the New Testament. Over 6,000. Over 6,000 and we can go back a couple of decades of the last writings. If that doesn't sound impressive to you, it's because you don't deal with ancient writings. People who deal with ancient materials will not just be impressed, highly impressed with these statistics I just gave. People are conversant with ancient materials. For example, if we are talking about Aristotle's poetics, Aristotle's poetics, we have less than a dozen manuscripts of Aristotle's poetics and the earliest one we can go back to is over a thousand years after the writing that's the earliest of Aristotle's poetics what about Julius Caesar if you want to go to Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars again less than a dozen and it's over 1000 years between the last writing and the first manuscript we can put our hands on a thousand years the best example we have in terms of numbers is Homo's Iliad. We have a few hundred manuscripts, but the earliest one we can put our hands on is 2,100 years after the original. And people have the audacity to question the New Testament. That's ridiculous. To say the least. If the Bible is not considered reliable or trustworthy by any institution or group of intellectuals, then no ancient document should be considered trustworthy. Did you get that? No ancient document. Because none of them come close to the Bible. I would say yes, but 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 Doctor Damina, you know, there's this overzealous monk theory. Have you heard of it? How many of you have watched the Da Vinci Code? You watched that? That's just a movie where they talk about the overzealous monk theory that Constantine guy, you know, the Constantine guy, you know, but that's not actual history. It's not. It's just a script by somebody. But even if we were to go there. Number one, there's a manuscript problem. Number two, there are 6,000 manuscripts. So if we have those monks that Constantine set up to change the New Testament, they will have to find 6,000 Greek manuscripts or portions of manuscript and change all of them the same exact way. Don't change your, your ink up. Don't get caught. Don't tell anybody what you did. Then there's a second layer. Jesus said, go and make disciples of every ethnic group. The problem with people's group is that they speak different languages. So the first centuries, the New Testament is translated into Syria, Coptic, and Latin. Syria, Coptic, and Latin. So now, your overzealous monks, during the time of Constantine, have to go and find 6,000 manuscripts or portions of it 
change them the same exact way then they have to learn to lie in Syria Coptic and Latin as well as they have to lie in Greek because if the Greek don't line up with the translations there will be a problem that's not the end of it the third layer of the problem is the early church fathers the early church fathers had this horrible habit of quoting and writing commentaries on the new testament so much so that if all we have is the writings of the early fathers if we collect their writings together we will have the entire new testament minus 11 verses that's the way the early fathers wrote so now those monks will have to find over 6,000 manuscripts learn how to lie in Syria Coptic and Latin and also lie in Greek get all the commentaries all over the world of the early church fathers make sure all the lies match and then they have to lie in Syria Coptic and Latin and Greek that's a big fantasy so we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses so far we have a good history book but watch this second peter 117 glory for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So listen carefully. We have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses and they report supernatural events. Mount of transfiguration. Supernatural. Moses and Elijah on the mount. Supernatural. The Bible is not a bunch of rules about religion. The Bible is a collection of supernatural events. This man claimed that Jesus healed the sick they saw. He walked on the water. He stopped the storm. Opened blind eyes. Raised the dead. They were there, they saw it. In fact, some of the people Jesus healed, he told them to go and show themselves to the priest. It was not done in the corner. Supernatural events. He died Friday. Rose Sunday. These are not just the writings of a religious community trying to pass down rules and regulations. We have a collection of Old Testament books. And these individuals talked about how Moses split the Red Sea, walked on dry land with over 3 million people, and commanded the water body to close down on the Egyptian army. Supernatural. Supernatural. The blood on the doorpost on the Passover night. The angel of death passed, took out those that were not in a house with blood, and touched none that was in a house with blood. Supernatural events. Moses threw his hands to heaven, brought it down. Manna was raining everywhere. Oh, yes. I believe in miracles. Shata Labahata. Teaching good? I'm almost done. Are you glad you came? Merry Christmas. Are you enjoying the Christmas meal? Zaza, zaza, zaza. So, it's not just supernatural events, but supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. In fulfillment of specific prophecies. Zazozo. It's not like faith healer prophecies where somebody will come in and say, There's somebody here, you have a waist pain. There's somebody here, your knee is paining you. Of course, you know that when people gather in a number, there'll be somebody with waist and knee. 
Somebody here, you didn't sleep well last night. In fact, 10 will come out. Those are healer. Those are the things. I'm talking about prophecies, for example, Isaiah 53. Isaiah gave that prophecy over 700 years before Jesus was born. Prophecies that Jesus will be born and he will be the suffering servant. Look at a prophecy like Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 to 8. Put it up for me. Since today is Christmas anyway. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9. No, 9 verse 6. 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Can we all read together like a mask for everybody? Christmas. Let's go. One, two, go. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Repeat it again. Repeat it again. Who is the mighty God? So outside Jesus there is no God. The mighty God, the everlasting, the prince of next verse. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go together, everyone. Want to go of the increase of his government and peace? There shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon the kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth. Even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this next verse. Now, everybody, the Lord sent a word into Jacob and it was lighting upon Israel. What was that word? That word is that Jesus will be born and he will be the light of the world. That was the prophecy. And one day an angel came to a virgin girl called Mary. Hail down, Mary. That was highly favored. You shall carry a baby. And he shall be called the son of the Holy Ghost. Mary said, how can these things be? Seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered, the power of the most high shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. And that holy baby shall be born. And Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the begotten of the father. Full of grace and truth. And of his fullness have we all received grace. Shall glory somebody. So his name shall be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. So when Jesus was born, who was born? God. And where was God? With us. So Jesus is God with us. I feel like I'm teaching here. Jesus is not junior God. Jesus is not God's errand boy. Jesus is God Almighty with us. In fulfillment of specific prophecy over 700 years it was prophesied so it's a supernatural document written with specific prophecies that have been fulfilled it's not a mutus so when you hold your bible and you say I believe the word of God it is final authority in my life. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says. You are speaking without a shadow of doubt. Am I teaching good? If you're catching the flow, shout, I hear you. Sit down, give me a few minutes, I'm done. The Jewish people don't like Isaiah 40, 53 because that tells them, shut up. It's in the Hebrew manuscripts. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Surely he was wounded for our transgressions. This is over 700 years ago. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. That was prophesied. And Jesus came and made it a reality. If that is not enough for any Jewish person. What about Psalm 22? What about Psalm 22? Now listen carefully. Jewish people don't call it Psalm 22. 
Because there are no verses and chapters. Verses and chapters came a hundred, few hundred years ago. So, if it was Jewish people I was talking to, I would have to use the title of that particular place, which is the first line. So, I would have had to tell them, open your scroll to Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathani. Because that's the way that place opens. Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabathani. One of David's songs. And who would have known that that song was exactly what Jesus was going to say on the cross. Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because of you, for the first time, God walked away from God. God turned to God and God said to God God said to God the Lord said to my Lord why hast thou forsaken me? He forsook him so he will never forsake you am I teaching somebody here? that's why after he rose he said I will never leave nor forsake you never ever never ever ever never why because I forsook Jesus your substitute on the cross so I never forsake you when you go through the fire I will be with you in the fire when you go through the water I'll be with you in the water when you fall I will fall with you and raise you up am I talking to somebody here in Christianity, we don't go to God. In Christianity, we don't go to God. Other religions are trying to go to their God. In Christianity, our God has come to us. Emmanuel, God with Somebody shout glory. I'm teaching God this morning. Psalm 22 verse 1 My God, my God Why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the walls of my roarings Oh my God, I cry in the daytime But thou hearest not And in the night season And I'm not silent This was on the cross Three days, three nights Next verse But thou art holy O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel Our fathers trusted in thee They trusted And thou didst deliver them So in the midst of David's songs You see prophecies of Jesus Next verse They cried unto thee And were delivered They trusted in thee And were not confounded Next verse But I'm a worm This is Jesus talking And no man A reproach of men and despised of the people he was despised and rejected so in the midst of the, the songs of david were prophecies concerning the christ next verse all they that see me laugh me to scorn as i said there's no beauty in him to desire him they shoot out the lip they shake their head saying they were shaking their head on jesus when he was on the cross he trusted on the lord that he would deliver him let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him next verse but thou art he that took me out of the womb Thou this wake me hope. Thou this make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Jump to verse, jump to verse, verse, verse 14, verse 14. Verse, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shell. And my tongue cleaved to the jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. This is Jesus on the cross. For dogs have come past me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Next verse. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare at me. Next verse. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Can you see prophecy? Can you see fulfillment? But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Now, not everybody who dies on the cross, his feet and hands are pierced. And when David wrote this psalm, there was nothing like cross. When David wrote this psalm, nobody has ever been crucified. So he didn't even have a natural idea of crucifixion. But it was in the prophecy. That's how authentic. That's how authoritative. That's how infallible. That's how 
erroneous the Bible is. And the errorless. That's how errorless the Bible is. He said, Father, into your hands are coming. Jesus didn't waste time on the cross. He made them put him on the cross. Within a few hours, I commit my spirit. You know why? So that they won't break his bones. If he didn't give up fast, they would have broken his bones. But in the prophecy, he said, none of his bones shall be broken. So the moment he got on the cross, he fulfilled the prophecy. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. He gave up the ghost. So they didn't have to break his bones. They buried him like that. And on the resurrection, he rose with his bones intact. To fulfill that prophecy. So we have a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. As I close, Second Peter 1.19 Woo! We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise where in your hearts. He's saying these fulfilled prophecies are not going to save you. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone that a man is saved. But pay attention to fulfill prophecies. Like a man ought to at night when you look and you see light you keep looking. So in case all I have said didn't move you keep looking. The light will get closer. And when the light gets closer you will see reason to be saved. Like a day star arise in your hearts until the door dawn, day dawn, and the day star arise in your heart. So let's let's put it together. We have a reliable collection of historical documents put together by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies, and their writings were divine rather than human origin. They, they, their writings were divine thousands of times thus saith the Lord thus saith the Lord and when the prophecies were fulfilled it gave credence to who was speaking some say but you can't believe anything written in any book because men wrote them yet you believe yourself you believe yourself and you can't believe what other men wrote you are fallible and you believe yourself I've had somebody say but I'm a man of science and unless this type of things can be proven scientifically I just can't believe it you know some people think they are very intelligent but they just display their illiteracy in public you see the scientific method is something has to be observable measurable and repeatable history is not observable measurable and repeatable you don't use the scientific method to prove historical events so if you say you need scientific method for historical events you sound like an idiot that's why history is not science history is arts because the method of checking history is different from the methods of checking science. You use the evidentiary method like you would in a court of law. So you ask about reliability of sources. You ask about corroboration of sources. That's what you look for. You ask about the internal and external evidence that support those sources. These are the kind of questions you ask. Who are the witnesses? Are they reliable witnesses? Is, there, is this witness falsifiable? Are there other things contradicting or confirming this? 
Those are the kind of questions you ask when you want to be evidential in your method of confirming stuff. And when you ask those questions, you come to three continents, three languages, over 40 authors, most of whom never met one another, kings, generals, fishermen, journalists, historians they wrote 66 volumes those volumes address hundreds of subjects and come together in a cohesive unit that tells one redemptive story one story the bible one character the bible one character one story one book one message one person that's a corroboration of scripture that's not just the end it's written over a period of 1500 years therefore you have corroboration you have reliability you have 25,000 archaeological digs related directly to matters discussed in the bible that have confirmed what we find here in we have writings of contemporaries that confirm what we find here in therefore the intelligent man is, the man is not the man that says I cannot simply believe it. The intelligent man is the man that says I choose to believe the Bible. Because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies. And their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And if that's not enough, I've tried it. It changed my life. Glory to God. I believe that with these simple points of mind. I have not only convinced you. But I have equipped you to convince others. That the Bible is the authoritative. Errorless. Infallible. Word of Almighty God. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. But in the power of God. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. Unto salvation. To everyone that believeth. To the Jews and to the Greeks. For therein is the righteousness of God. Revealed from faith to faith. As it is written. The just. Get on your feet and celebrate your faith in Christ. Is that how they celebrate your faith in Christ. In your view. Glory. Glory, glory, glory. Lift your hand and shout, I'm saved by grace. Grace alone. In Christ alone. Through faith alone. No works. Purely saved by grace. I mean, which other book will you want to be the authority in your life? When other religions, it was an angel that appeared to their author. Nobody else saw no corroboration, no proof, nothing. Just him and the angel, and he wrote, and, the, and people are dying in those religions. Then you have. Somebody asked me somewhere, Dr. Demina, why do you say only through Jesus can man be saved? That's this cause for another day. I'm coming to you with that. Why can't a man be saved through Muhammad, Buddha, Shintoism? Why? That's another apologia. I will give you. I will show you with all evidences across the board that only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can save. Hallelujah. Only Jesus can save. Can we do smoke crusade? Everybody with your hands. Want to go? Only Jesus can save. Only Jesus can save. Your mother cannot save you. Your father cannot save you. Hallelujah. Only Jesus can save. Hallelujah. Only Jesus can save. Hallelujah. Your papa cannot save you. Your church cannot save you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Only Jesus. Everybody shout hallelujah. I remember my crusade days. 
I have a joy, the joy of salvation, the joy of the joy of salvation I have a joy the joy of salvation the joy of deliverance joy every day joy 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 every day happy 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 every day joy 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 every day the joy of salvation Isn't that a reason to celebrate? Glory! Father, I pray for everybody in this building, every man, woman, on television, on radio, those watching online, in this building, around the world, that the truth of the gospel comes alive. The reality of the saving knowledge of Christ. The death, the burial. The resurrection. The substitutionary sacrifice. He took my place in death. He died my death. He took my sins on him. And he nailed them on the cross. He rose from the dead for my justification. And father that whosoever believes in Christ. Shall not perish. But have everlasting life. I pray for those that have burdens and yokes. And those that are carrying life's cares. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy loading. I will give you rest. That Lord, this will be an encounter with the reality of the rest that only Christ provides. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for the blessing upon this house. I pray that as we celebrate today and as we fellowship with one another, that these realities will resonate fully in our hearts. And we give you praise and glory for answer prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note.